So um, the first module in this lecture is just a little bit of an intro uh, and or perhaps refresher for the engineers on optimization theory. So um, as a little bit of a motivation, um, there, there has recently been a proposal of a new way, um, an alternative to the common spatial patterns plus LDA approach, um, which is applicable to spectral processes and which is a basically this, a single unified um, approach which, which gives you a globally optimal solution. So you can prove that uh, what you get is optimal under some assumptions that are comprehensible in a sense. So that's um, desirable, of course, as opposed to this, which is a two-stage procedure. And it's very hard to reason about under which conditions it's actually optimal. And so this method learns in one step both the spatial filters and um, whatever relative weightings of these filters that go into the final output that the BCI calculates, so, you know, such as your whatever, stressed or not stressed or something like that, or your workload level. Um, the, the method is pretty much applicable to any sort of stationary oscillatory process that, that you might have. And it is op an optimization-based approach. So that's why we're going to discuss this now. So basically, what the field is concerned with, many of you obviously know this already, is you're starting with an objective function or a cost function, f, say. And the cost function has some parameters, um, say here theta 1 and theta 2. And it quantifies uh, the cost of <laughs> using these parameters for something. Um, so for example, the misfit between what your model with these parameters would predict and what you knew are the true labels, say. Um, that would be a cost function. Or say, the discrepancy between what you assume and what you observed, or things like that. <laughs> or in, in general, whatever, the price you pay for a particular pricing stra whatever, strategy or something. But in our case, it's primarily the, the mismatch between the prediction of your model for a certain set of parameters and the, what the data says, the calibration data. So there's two big areas. Um, and I should say, generally, it's about finding, of course, an assignment of parameters, uh, such as here, for such that your cost function is optimal. And of course, this whole thing works in any number of dimensions. So there's two big branches, you can say. Um, one is local optimization, one is global optimization. And uh, global optimization is concerned with finding the global uh, optimum of the function, even if there's multiple local optima, such as here. And um, so it is a rather general um, approach. And there is approximate techniques, such as simulated annealing and so on, which sample the space, et cetera. There is other techniques. Um, and you have to run these for long enough until you believe that you found <laughs> the optimum, basically. And there's exact methods that assume, for example, something about the slope of this function, how fast does it change, and so on. The trouble is these can be very, very slow, especially if you have pathological data like here. So um, it might take you very long to find an optimum, especially also if this is high dimensional. It can be basically absolutely impossible to, to do that uh, if you have a malformed or ill posed problem, if you will. And so the other branch is local optimization. There, um, <laughs> the goal is somewhat more restricted. The task is only to take an initial guess and improve it incrementally, say. Um, and you can no longer improve it. Uh, so say until you, for example, found a local optimum like here. So if you start it all right, you're fine. It can get stuck on a plateau. It can get stuck on if you start here, for example, and so on. But that's not the point. Um, the point is to have a method that can improve some parameters, um, whatever you started with. And so the most frequently used or simplest kind of approach is called gradient descent, which is you evaluate um, the gradient of your cost function, um, gradient vector, basically, or you know, partial derivatives, and pretty much walk in the direction of steepest descent, which is you know, if the gradient points up, that would be walking down in the opposite direction. So all you need to do is take your cost function and derive the equation for the first derivative. And then you can just iteratively say, OK, I want to update, um, go in that direction, next update, and so on. And eventually, you will find that you can no longer uh, improve it. So that's gradient descent. There's various flavors of that. You know, there's If your cost function, for example, is, f is calculated in terms of data observations, um, you might um, you know, calculate it for, say, the, all the data, or you might an update, or you might calculate it just for a subset of your data. 
and take that as a somewhat noisy or stochastic, um, but perhaps faster to calculate update. So this is specific to how the cost function kind of looks internally. Um, that's called stochastic gradient descent, and it's somewhat tricky to get um, <laughs> to make sure that despite it being noisier, you actually still converge to something and so on. Um, but anyway, so that's gradient descent. The other um, somewhat more advanced fundamental technique is Newton's method, um, which is known you know, from <laughs> uh, actually from school, Newton's method, right, to find zeros of functions. Uh, in multiple dimensions, it requires you know, the Hessian matrix, which B, uh, which in a sense encodes the curvature at a particular point. So say you're here, it encodes in a sense the second order quadratic type curvature of the data uh, or of the function. And um, accounting for that, you can actually um, arrive at your, you can deal with certain kinds of um, cost functions that gradient descent typically fails on. So for example, this data here, I think this is a Rosenbrock function, gradient descent will start and then it starts to bounce around in the direction of steepest descent in this kind of tunnel. It's like a ravine. And so steepest descent is always you know, left, right, like if you roll a ball into that. And it will pretty much never reach the point, you know. Whereas um, Newton method basically, <laughs> in a sense, sees that this is a long, s s extended um, you know, uh, surface, and it will shoot right to the solution. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, the benefit. You have fewer updates, but you need to ca <coughs> calculate this matrix, which can be pretty large. It's basically a number of features squared. Um, and secondly, you have to essentially calculate this term, gradient you know, times the inverse of b, in a sense. And so that part itself can also be costly, but there's ways to deal with it. You can calculate this directly without inverting B and things like that. Um, and so that's a, a traditional technique. Now, both of these functions are smooth, by the way. Um, so that's a little uh, uh, side note. I'll get back to that later. And there's a flavor of, of the general Newton approach, which is called quasi-Newton. And it, in a sense, combines benefits of both. It pretty much approximates the Hessian inverse from the gradients that you saw in previous iterations. So it just, in a sense, updates its current estimate of the Hessian as it goes along, um, just from gradients. And so you don't have to derive the equation for that, number one. And you also don't have to calculate this huge matrix, necessarily. And there is one variant which is probably the most popular off-the-shelf method. It's called LBFGS, Limited Memory Broiden Fletcher Gulpfarb Channel. It's um, it's a second order optimizer. It implements basically this type of update rule. And all it needs is, like here in MATLAB, your cost function, which outputs the objective value, cost, and the gradient for that point, gradient vector. And it needs a starting point. And it'll give you, after some iterations uh, evaluating your cost function, it'll give you the optimum, you know, the local optimum near your initial starting point, perhaps. And that, by the way, this function is included in BCI lab, so you can get it from the dependencies if you want to use it standalone or so. So it can be really, really easy if you manage to formulate a cost function and, and derive a gradient to optimize something. OK, so it's already clear to engineers, of course, but um, it may not be immediately clear to uh, everyone who d drops into the BCI field. And so um, as, as you might already imagine, you can, if your function is not appropriately you know, suited, you might get stuck in some local optima or so, which is bad. Um, but perhaps you're able to formulate or, or cough up a type of problem um, where the function has some nice properties such that this doesn't happen. So it, basically that it has only one global optimum. And um, the currently most popular such property is called convexity. The, you know, to make this simple, the basic idea is that there is, in a sense, in this optimization landscape, a direct line of sight between any point and any other. And there's no bump in between which blocks this line of sight, uh, so no local optima. It implies that there is a single local optimum, and that's um, the global optimum. And um, basically, um, if the problem is also smooth, then any local optimization technique will usually find that optimum. Gradient descent, Newton method. I mean. Uh, under some conditions, you might come up with a, with a specific pathology in the problem so that some of these methods run very slowly or perhaps still fail. But um, that's basically the thing that, that you, you can uh, you know, kind of bet on that in some sense. And so I what's kind of surprising is that there are many, many problem types, such as you know, I want to achieve this and that, which you can formulate as convex optimization problems, even though it might not be obvious 
at first glance how to do that. Uh, so that's a constraint on the function of form. You know, it needs to be of certain kinds of uh, function of forms. The other part that you want to have um, is, or that you need to think about, is whether the problem is actually smooth or whether it has features that are not differentiable. If they are not differentiable, such as a, a very sharp, you know, such as absolute value or so, um, then let's say gradient descent, as it comes, you know, um, doesn't necessarily work. If it runs into that, it's not differentiable. There is alternatives to deal with that kind of thing. Um, several, in fact. So one fix is to use a surrogate for that cost function, where the non-smooth parts are actually smoothed out. And there's a whole framework, um, come, you know, which was invented by Nesterov, and it relates a bit to proximal optimization and so on, to come up with these kinds of versions of your cost function, which are actually smooth. So you can go on and use whatever you always use. The other one is, um, in some cases, there is there's alternative problems that are, if you manage to optimize that, you can also solve the original problem which happen to be smooth under some cases. You can split, in many cases, the non-smooth and the smooth terms and deal with them separately. Um, and perhaps have an analytic equation for the non-smooth part. That's a framework called operator splitting. And there's bun a bunch of other names for that, proximal splitting, douglas Rashford splitting, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can use an optimizer which inherently is able to deal with non-smooth functions. And one of them is subgradient descent, which sort of you know, takes a gradient from one side and a gradient from the other side, and, uh, and you know, finds the uh, you know, agreement direction in a sense. So you can definitely deal with all these issues in case your function exhibits those. And that, um, that's basically the end of this little uh, intro teaser. 